Thank you very much. Uh, is it better? Is it better now? Assalamu alaikum. I'm very happy to be here and honored, pleased. And uh, just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Mam Omar Job. I am a national from Senegal, but I am serving as a senior specialist uh, at the UNESCO International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa, which is based in uh, Ethiopia, in Addis Abeba. And uh, I would like to extend my uh, great thanks to Pagogot, who happened to be my colleague back in the years in UNESCO headquarters in Paris. And then also thank you to the Minister of Education and Culture for giving us this opportunity to exchange with uh, the Indonesia uh, today. Thank you. Um, next, please, for the slides. I will, okay. So who knows about UNESCO IGBA? Raise your hand. I'm just expect, expecting one. Okay, okay, so Pago God knows about it. But you all know about UNESCO, right? Of course. So UNESCO, UNESCO has uh, different sectors which are dealing with education, science, culture, and communication information. Now, if we remain at the E of UNESCO, it's education. And within the education sector, we have different uh, specialized institutes. Uh, one of them is education planning in Paris. One of them is Bureau of Education dealing with curriculum issues in Geneva. There is another one which is dealing with uh, statistics, you know, uh, enrollment rates, uh, the girls' portion in uh, enrollment, completion rates worldwide. That one is called UIS and is based in uh, Montreal. But in 1999, the African member states the whole Africa got together in UNESCO during the general conference and they decided to create one institute which is dedicated to Africa, meaning that our activities, we cannot implement them in Indonesia or elsewhere. We only can implement it in Africa, within Africa, and dealing with teachers' issues. So all what we do since 1999 is related to teachers. Um, so the team within this institute is 25 people with 12 different nationalities, citizenship. And one of the citizenship is Indonesian. We have an Indonesian who is in my team who happened to be a loan expert from the government of Indonesia. Um, and then we are manda mandated to strengthen teacher policy and development within the continent. Next, please. So what do we do? Uh, we work in three different blocks. The first one is capacity development. Um, capacity development, what is it? To build the capacities. Most of people, they, they, they tend to think that it's training teachers. But it's not about only training teachers, but it's also about helping the governments to do some policies in relation to teachers. How do you profile them? How do you train them? How do you recruit them? How do you deploy them? Career progression and all those issues around the teachers. We also do capacity development at the institutional level, which is we work with universities and teacher education institutions on how to design programs to train teachers so they can be empowered when they are in the classroom uh, to manage the class and to have pedagogical activities. So that's the first block. The second block is partnership and advocacy. We partner with major actors in the teachers area. Not only governments, but also teachers union. We partner with teachers unions, we partner also with uh, technical assistant partners like UNICEF, ILO, and all these major actors. We advocate for teachers because um, we happen to be able to compare between countries, and then when we notice some good practices, we advocate in other settings. And the third last block is about research and development. We do a lot of research, both academic and action research. Action research at the level of the teachers when they practice uh, uh, their teaching in the classroom. Uh, what do we learn from that practice and how could we fit into 
the pre-service training at the institutional level. Uh, those three blocks, there is something which is cross-cutting. When we do all of this, we do also what we call South-South cooperation. South-South cooperation is not learning from the North, uh, not learning from Europe how they do, because settings are different and the challenges are not the same. But this is part, part of South-South cooperation. Coming to Indonesia, seeing what is happening and how they are addressing those challenges. When I go back to African countries, I can talk about what I have seen here. And today, what I have learned was uh, from the Ministry of Finance that 20% of your budget is in the Constitution, which is for me something which is um, out of, I mean, it's unique. Because in Africa, we tend to have issues related to funding the education sector. It has to go to the National Assembly, it has to go through a lot of debates and to justify how, uh, how uh, efficient would be to use that money into the education system. But here you don't have to do that, it's in your constitution. Next please. Too fast. <laughs> Okay, the cross-cutting issues we deal with and critical issues. So as you can see, in the core, in the center of all our activities, we tend to have two priorities. One of which is gender, related to young girls and women education. And the second one is the information communication technologies. Those are, are our two priorities in Africa. Um, we can talk about it, there can be a lot of debate, but these two critical issues we identified as critical area to invest in in the future to address the transformational process we are facing these days. And around it, we have other issues that are around those two core issues. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There is a crisis in Africa where we have noticed that um, the quality has really fallen down. And if you zoom into that problem, you would then notice that it's worse when it comes to girls than boys. The second one is related to education in emergencies and post-conflict situations. As you know, in uh, Africa, there are a lot of conflicts and emergencies. Uh, sometimes it's related to nature, so natural disasters. Sometimes it's related to individuals. It can be the form of violent extremism, wars, and uh, attacks from uh, other, uh, within the country, inter-tribes inter or extra, uh, uh, extra border uh, coming from uh, an invader. Um, the next one would be the education for sustainable development. So looking at all those issues, how do we want to build a sustainable society and then project ourselves in the future? So we talk about global citizenship education also. Our activities talk about prevention, how to prevent the violent extremism through education. We try to empower the teachers on skills, transformational uh, pedagogy, so they can uh, early detect some radicalization and then address it in the proper way. And then we have also activities related to peace building and anti-corruption. Corruption is an issue in Africa and this year has been declared year of anti-corruption by the African Union Commission. Um, entrepreneurship, of course. Entrepreneurship, why? Because we believe that uh, uh, beyond the talent that we want to enhance, uh, people have their own, if they are organized and have their own skills in a conducive environment, they would be able to transform the society we live in. And lastly, we have issues that are pertaining to learning assessment, because most of teachers, they do homeworks and assessment as a duty without learning from it. But it's a source of a feedback of the teaching, not the learning of the kids. Uh, that's what we believe in, and uh, we have activities in that. And the last one is related to language of instruction. As you know, Africa has a lot of languages, and uh, it happened to be uh, one of uh, the most colonized uh, territory in the world. And we have francophone system, anglophone system, and lusophone. 
but within uh, the national system. Uh, some studies have shown that if the, the, the young people learn in their mother tongue, they are most likely to learn more and better. Next, please. So how we do that? Uh, we act at, in three levels. The highest level is the continental level, which is the whole Africa, 54 member states. Uh, we do a lot of researches and we do a lot of studies. Uh, one of the most recent one we are doing right now is what we call the Continental Teacher Mobility Protocol. What is a Continental Teacher Mobility Protocol? It's looking at um, those people who are displaced. Anyone knows about South Sudan? Darfur? Okay, the Lake Chad area where Boko Haram is striking and then ACME in, the, in North Mali. So what does it have as a consequence? It has some displaced people, right? And among those displaced people, there are teachers and students. So how do we make sure that a teacher who is leaving South Sudan, going to Uganda or to Kenya, is recognized as a teacher? How do we make sure? So we do, we do those kind of studies and we come up with some solutions that we propose to the African Union Commission so they can take the decision to put some standards in the profession, teaching profession, and then to put some kinds of norms of uh, um, exercising the, pro uh, the profession. The aim is to have the member states of Africa ratify it and then have it validated so when a crisis happens, a teacher is recognized as a teacher elsewhere. If we go in the mid-level, which is the regional level, what we call regional level here is um, the regional economic, at the le uh, level of regional economic commission. Uh, some people hear about West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, Northern Africa, those are the regional levels. Um, at that level, one concrete example is what the work we are doing with the Southern African Development Community, which is called SADEC. Inside, you will find countries like South Africa, Botswana, Mozambique, and uh, um, Swaziland, and all those countries. Uh, we are working with them to put some standards in, which, in such a way that uh, South Africa can train teachers for Botswana and vice versa. So teachers could be mobile and in an integrated manner in, within the region they are in. The, most downstream level is the country level where we do technical assistance. We work with ministries of education, helping them to make policies. Teacher education institution, helping them to design training programs and then train some teachers and put them in networks so they can improve uh, the, the pedagogical practice. And that can take a form of pre-service or in-service teacher training or continuous professional development. Next, please. Okay, in doing so, we try to contextualize the SDG4, because in Indonesia, they talk about SDG4. In Korea, they talk about SDG4. In the US, in France, but at the same time also in South Sudan, in Uganda, they talk about the same SDG4, but how do we contextualize it, make it relevant to the context? So, the the, the agenda is to meet what is written there, substantially increase the supply of qualified teachers, including through international cooperation, for teacher training in developing countries, especially least developed countries and small island and developing states. Um, in Africa, we have what we call the Agenda 2063. Agenda 2063 looking at the 50 years beyond going beyond the SDG4, which is Agenda 2030. We try to look at the two, and in Africa we say an integrated, prosperous, peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizen, and represent, representing a dynamic force in international arena. Uh, here, we see integrated. Uh, that's, that is translating what I was talking about earlier a teacher who is trained in South Africa, who can be employed in Botswana or in Mozambique. So it's a, like a, an integration uh, process. 
we are talking about prosperous because natural resources are there, but probably it's not well managed and the governance is not okay. And we are talking about peaceful because we have been facing a lot of issues uh, linked to terrorism, linked to wars, and linked to natural disasters. More than half children, uh, more than half um, children, um, a million in the world, do not acquire proficiency standards in uh, reading and in mathematics in Africa. We account for that. And uh, there are a lot of disparities between urban and rural areas. When I was seeing you gaming uh, live here on the screen, it was, I was, it was inspiring me because myself, I have benefited from that. Uh, I mean, I'm from Senegal, did my studies in Europe and then the US, and I'm working back in Africa, but, so I know what is ICT. But that is not the case of all uh, the Africans, and that is not the case of the majority of people living in Africa because they are isolated. They don't have access to basic infrastructures. And uh, talking about connectivity and ICT is something out of the blue, just to set the context. Um, when we talk about ECD, early childhood education and development, Sub-Saharan Sub Sub Africa accounts for 41% um, in Age, uh, people who are aged to be at the early childhood uh, education, we have only 41% attending it. So it means this 59% uh, is left out. We, whilst here in Asia, you account for 63%. And in the north, they account for 70 something. Africa is at 41. Uh, among the six 117 million people of people who are at the age of uh, going to school, primary and secondary. Africa by itself accounts for 58% of that number. 58%. Uh, in 2016, UNESCO reported that only 34% of primary school in least developed countries so 34% of primary school in least developed countries had access to electricity. And 40% of those schools, 40% only were equipped with basic sanitation, hand washing sanitation facilities. This is the reality. So when we talk about this agenda, we have to contextualize it. Next, please. So, how do we respond to Education 4.0? So you see that <laughs> the way to go is far, far, far beyond what you guys have to go and far beyond what uh, Europeans and uh, Western have to go. Um, but we are lucky to have this agenda 2063, which is not looking at 15 years or 10 years, but 50 years, half of a century. Um, and it is a strategic framework for the socioeconomic transformation of the continent over the next 50 years. It builds on and seeks to accelerate the implementation of past and existing continental initiative for growth and sustainable development. Um, the first aspiration, which is in that agenda, reads, well-educated and skilled citizens underpinned by science, technology, and innovation for a knowledge society, which, which, which should be the norm, and no child misses school due to poverty or any form of discrimination. What is interesting here, to come up with this, it was a bottom-up process. Bottom-up process, um, which uh, allowed extensive consultation, extensive consultation of African citizens throughout the continent, north to south, east to west. There were several consultations to make sure that uh, 
there is no bureaucracy, meaning that people sitting in their office and doing plans, but it was rather to hear the voice of the African directly so we can translate it into a strategy. The next interesting thing is, uh, is results oriented, meaning that from the result we are seeking from the citizens, that's what was translated in this vision. Next, please. So, uh, that 50 year plan translates in a 10 years plan, which is called the CESA, Continental Education Strategy for Africa. Continental Education Strategy for Africa. It has seven guiding principles. Seven guiding principles, and the first one talks about the teachers. So in this CESA, uh, there are some key actions that were outlined clearly with indicators which will be monitored at the level of country, at the level of region, and then at the level of the continent. And uh, it's clearly said in that continental education strategy for Africa that we should help the countries to formulate policies in relation to ICT integration, build capacity build, um, build the capacities of teachers, but not only teachers, but also the learners into ICT uh, use. Build also the capacity of education managers and leaders and then the administrators. Because uh, we believe that the whole chain from the learner, the teacher, his supervisor, the administrator and the decider at the policy level, the whole chain has to be at the same level when we talk about ICT and the use of ICT. And we all know that learning, learning occurs in an environment, right? So it's not only the teacher and the student, but it's also the environment. But that environment today is changing and there is a transformation process which is taking it into the technological area. So we should also promote the development of online contents local and uh, taking into account the local specificities. In this sense, I've been working myself and my colleagues from the Institute with CMO, CMO Secretariat, uh, where we are collaborating in online lectures and then trying to get uh, the African teachers who are interested in those platforms so they can have access to some open uh, resources. And we should capitalize on existing and successful ICT-driven initiatives like there is a successful uh, example in Africa which is called the Pan-African E-University, which is run by the African Union and based in Nairobi. People can register online and then have uh, their classes throughout and there is a face-to-face -face, uh, session which is uh, also, it's a blended approach. But we believe that it's not only that, it's also providing appropriate and sufficient equipment uh, government should invest in connectivity uh, access uh, from the rural and then um, a basic thing which is access to power because without power how can you use technology and of course uh, invest in the mobile and online education training platforms next please so this is Africa looks a bit uh, stretched, but it's a bit <laughs> closer. So the most western part is where I am from, Senegal, and the most eastern part is where I am coming from, which is Ethiopia. Between the two is nine hours flight and three hours difference. Just to give you um, a sense of the, uh, the territory. Um, the institute is pretty much covering the continent with the specific uh, uh, support we are giving. So you can see ICT for gender responsive quality STEM education for francophone countries. What does that mean? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We have seen that there are a lot of issues when we compare the countries and we came out to the result that Africa was behind everybody in the world and we zoom into that result, we saw that the girls were the worst impacted. It doesn't mean that the girls are not good in science, but they are not encouraged 
to go in scientific areas. Rather, boys are encouraged. That is specifically cultural. So how do we tackle those kind of issues? Uh, this is what we're talking about here. The use of ICT and then having a gender responsive lens and in what, when we do it. And this is supported by Japan. That's why it says JFIT. Um, we have also the supported uh, Hainan project which is dealing with um, also girls' education, simply girls' education, get, give access to girls because they face issues related to early mar marriage or rather a family saying to the boy to go to school and the girl to take care of the house uh, work, so those kind of issues. Um, in the Central Africa, we have a project which is called Teacher Support and Motivation. Uh, a teacher still <laughs> has his status in Asia. And uh, for example, I went to Japan when they say sensei, I mean, it's a high profile and then people are really respected. You go to Africa, you find a teacher, you ask him what he is doing, what is his job, he will be shy to tell you that he's a teacher. He thinks that's the least profession that one has to do. So how do we deal with that? How do we support them? How do we motivate those kind of activities? And then you go a bit up north in the Sahel countries, we have the prevention of violent extremism and peace building project, transformative pedagogy. We talked about integration earlier. You go to West Africa, they share the same currency, they share the same languages, they share borders, meaning you don't need a visa to travel, but at the same time, if you have a terrorism in one country, they share it. So how do we counter-attack uh, about that thing? How do we prevent it to occur? We believe that it's not military and humanitarian, it's also by education that we can change minds. Next, please. Um, we produce a lot of resources and tools which are also uh, common public goods, uh, open to anybody who can log into our, who just go to our website to download it. You will find some resources in French, in Espanol, Arabic, and English, but most of them are English published. Um, one of the study I was talking about, uh, which is the teacher support and motivation framework for Africa, uh, the emerging patterns. I led it, I led that study, and then uh, basically the main finding of that study was that uh, to motivate a teacher is not by increasing the salary only. No, it's more complicated than that. There are some other components that you have to act on, which are related to career progression, which are related to governance, which are related to transparency, and those are not pecuniary. And also, the most prominent uh, reason that we have found out, for example, in Uganda, was giving a teachers a voice. When you do the curriculum, when you do the policy, you have to hear the teacher's voice. What does the teacher think? But when are we going to stop thinking for the teacher? Um, yes, we believe that teaching, and it's the truth, is the one profession that creates all other professions. And we, uh, that is our motto, and this is what is fueling our energy to always uh, keep positive in the developments. Next, please. Shukran. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Terry Makasi. Mr. Mame Omar Diop, you are kindly asked to remain on stage to receive the token of appreciation from Mr.